Content Source Podcast, the show all about how to create content to attract, convert, and keep your ideal clients. Welcome to episode 231. I'm Susie Daphnis, and with me is my co-host, Michelle Falzon. Hey, Michelle, how are you? Hey there, Susie. I'm actually doing really well, and I'm looking forward to speaking with you, as I always look forward to speaking with you. And we have a special guest today because there are some really big changes coming with relation to email and compliance. And this has a direct impact, and we mean direct impact, on getting your emails in the inbox of the people on your email list. These changes are coming very soon as this episode goes to air. And we have a great guest today who is an expert in email automation to tell us what those changes are and when and how we need to be dealing with them. Yeah, I am very excited to talk about this topic. And here's what I want you to know as you're listening. Even if you're not technical, this is the great thing about our guest is that she speaks in plain language and is going to make things so clear for you so that you know the exact steps to take as these changes are coming through. Our guest is Cheryl Rerick. She's an email marketing strategist, an automation engineer, and a deliverability expert who brings the magic of automation to entrepreneurs, coaches, course creators, so that they can live their lives, she says, away from the tyranny of tiny screens. She's the creator of the automated chill method, which I love the name of. And this is her long-term conversion system, which helps you make more passive sales and free hours, frees up hours in your week, helping you create a successful business all through email. So let's go ahead and get Cheryl on the line. Hey, Cheryl, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. We are so excited. This is a topic that our listeners have been asking about. And um, so we're going to dive right in. So many of us use email daily, whether we love it or not. uh, But the intricacies of email deliverability still remain a bit of a mystery to most of us. And as content creators, people who want to get a return on investment from our emails, could you shed a little bit of light on how email deliverability functions in the overall digital space and our digital strategies? Yes, I would love to. I think it's something that most people don't actually understand. We we think, you know, you you write this email and it's a lot of work to write an email and get the, you know, get the tone right and speaking right to your audience and you you do all that work and then you paste it into your email service provider, your ESP, you know, like your ConvertKit, your Active Campaign, your Flowdesk, MailerLite. And then you hit send and we imagine it arriving in their inbox. They signed up for our emails, they gave us consent to email them. We hit send, they get the email. That's what we typically think happens. Mm. Mm. Um, And even those of us who know how email works, when I write an email, that's still in my mind of what's going on. When in reality, there's all kinds of steps that happen in the background for them to even get the email in the first place. When we're talking specifically about email deliverability, most people actually think that's the job of their email service provider. Mm -hmm. When in reality, it's our job. Almost, I would say 95%, it's our job. So once you hit that send button, first of all, it goes to what we call a mail transfer agent. So it goes into the back end and it sort of queues up to be sent the time Mm -hmm. you scheduled it to send. Because sometimes we schedule things in advance and stuff like that, right? And then at which point it it goes to the, the inbox server. So that could be like Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, whoever their inboxes are with. And it says, hey, I have an email here from Cheryl to Susie, will you accept it? And they look at a bunch of code on the back end that's attached to that email and they decide yes or no. And up until now, you didn't have to show like ID or prove who you say you are when you send that email. Mm. They would just sort of go, oh, you know, Susie's with ConvertKit, we'll take ConvertKit's word for it. We'll use their, they have a good reputation, so we'll accept this email. Whereas now there's some changes happening in the industry. You now have to prove who you say you are, each of us at that exchange point. And then after that, that's when it goes through the spam filters that we all know. You know, we know if you use certain words or too many images, there's potential to land in the spam folder. So that happens afterwards. That point where they either say, yes, we'll take the email or no, we won't. That's what they consider deliverability. That's delivered. From there, though, we have no idea if it's ending up in the inbox. They may still never see that. But their responsibility is done. The rest of that is like rides on our shoulders, right? And our best practices 
And so we actually have more control than you think you do over your own email deliverability. So it's actually good news, not bad news. I'm looking forward to hearing more to, more about that. And thank you for taking us behind the scenes because many of us are like, ah, Oh, we've heard that Google and Yahoo, they're all rolling out these significant changes, which I can understand from a um, safety perspective or trying to eliminate spam. But what are the implications of these updates for businesses, especially as it relates to us as email marketers? Well, that's it's at that exchange point now that we have mm-hmm. to show up on our own reputation, which means now more than ever before, our email practices and good habits matter because when we do these this authentication practices, which we might talk about here in a minute, these changes that they're they're asking us to do, what that means ultimately is now we have to show up on our own reputation, meaning your own domain name. So for me, that's mm-hmm. CherylRarick.com because I sent email from, you know, Cheryl at CherylRarick.com. So for you, it would be whatever your at is. Mm-hmm. And that's your domain. And that's going to have a reputation attached to it now going forward. And so now we can't like skate by the way we used to. Um, I think we sort of ignored email and the, you know, the technical aspects of email. We pay attention to the social algorithms all the time. You know, is it better to post carousels or reels or this or that? But we haven't really had to pay attention to email best practices too mm. much. And so now going forward, I think we just need to pay a little bit more attention. Email is worth paying attention to. It's it's the money maker, you know, for us entrepreneurs, for sure. And uh, we just have to be a little bit more careful and deliberate how we approach our email marketing going forward. Mm, Thank you. Yes, you mentioned that phrase, authentication practices. It feels like (laughs) a giant bucket of stuff that we need to know about. And we'll talk about the timeline a little later because it's, you know, the time is kind of uh, as we go to air with this episode really upon us to be really thinking about this. So we'll ask you about that in more detail. But this could feel to people that maybe aren't a bit aren't techy, don't understand a lot of the, the jargon, are maybe doing a lot of their own DIY marketing. This can feel pretty daunting to hear some of the acronyms that are thrown around and some of the things that we've got to do to be compliant, to authenticate our emails. And I actually heard, you know, something like estimates say, you know, 80% or more of emails that are sent are not compliant and a giant amount of email is going into spam folders. So what are some of these authentication practices? What are some of the things you might tell our listeners that they need to be doing to confidently make sure their emails are arriving in the inbox and that they're navigating some of the changes that are coming? Sure, I'd love to. Can we can we get a little bit into those acronyms to help demystify that sure. maybe? I think your Let's listeners might that. like that because I think that's partly what's so scary right now. It's twofold. Number one, email is our livelihood and it really matters right? Like that's scary. The threat of losing that is a Mm. big deal. And then number two, we're talking technical stuff with a bunch of acronyms that mean like it's word salad to us. It doesn't mean anything. And that can feel very scary because there's a direct result on our business. So let's demystify that a bit. So when we're talking about implementing authentication for your email, we're talking about just um, authenticating your domain to show ID to those servers to say, listen, I actually am who I say I am. Because actually, a lot of spam, you mentioned a lot of spam out there. And it's actually not that hard for spammers to sort of sneak your identity, you know, and deliver email that looks like it's from you, but they they sort of hijack it. So Mm -hmm. that's what we're going to prevent. So it's actually all really, really good stuff. And that's stuff we should have been doing all along, probably anyways. And it's only going to protect our brand. So it's not so scary. It's it's not happening to us. It feels like that's happening to us, right? Google's mm. doing this to us right now. And they are, and they did put a deadline on it. But it's all really good stuff for us to have as a brand. So the first thing you need to know is called SPF, Sender Policy Framework. And you don't need to know that acronym. You don't need to know what that means. <laughs> you want to think of SPF as your approved senders list. So when we're talking about all of these acronyms, all it is is a line of code on your, your domain um, DNS records. So DNS records are usually where your website records are. It's just a bunch of codes. Um, usually it's where you paid for your domain name or where you pay for your mm-hmm. website hosting It's usually one of those companies where you can find your DNS records. And so you're just copying and pasting code in. It's not as scary as it sounds. And SPF is one piece of code that you paste in that lists all the places you send email from. So it's like saying, 
okay, I allow my email service provider to send emails on my behalf. I allow maybe Stripe to send emails from my domain, right. from at CherylRerick.com. Maybe I allow my course platform or maybe I have, like I personally have transactional emails that go through Amazon SES. So I have to mm -hmm. think of all the places I send email from and list them out here so that when that email is sent, they're going to check that and say, does Cheryl authorize these people to send email from her? Like, are they cool or are they pretending mm -hmm. to be Cheryl, right? And then they'll approve or like accept the email, reject the email or put it in spam accordingly. So it's just it's like telling the email post office who's allowed to deliver mail on your behalf. Mm. So it's not so scary, right? It's okay. It. The next one that you need to have more code is called DKIM, which is domain keys identified mail. You don't need to know that either. And I like to think of that as a wax seal on an envelope, you know, like in the old days, I think of like that, the, the show outlander or something like an old timey where they have the wax seal it has your special emblem on it mm -hmm. if that it arrives shadow. it's so good right and it's and if it arrives untampered with you know you know because of the wax seal that's what dkim does for your emails it makes sure it's not tampered with while it's traveling to its destination and that's pretty cool i think right like that's pretty fun yeah. i want that i want some wax seals on my emails <laughs> and that's all it is we call them keys so keys are like the emblem that you like imprint into the right. wax seals so Again, you need to do that for every place you send email from. I think that's what a lot, a lot of people miss. You need to do that from your Google Workspace or your Outlook 365 and also your email service provider and also anywhere else that you send email from. So part of the hardest part is trying to figure out where the heck you send email from, right? right. To make the big right. to-do list. That's the hardest part. And yeah. then after that, you can just implement these quite simply by copying and pasting some code. The last one, and this one's getting the most publicity, which is funny to me, is people are calling it the DMARC changes. So DMARC is getting a name for itself. And that's just some more code. Um, this one I like to call the contingency plan. So mm. your DMARC that you put on there is just what to do if either of the other two fail. Mm. So it's just the checks and balances one. It's the one that, that you tell the Google or Yahoo, what to do with mail that arrives from you if it doesn't pass either of the other two? Should they let it through? Should they send it to spam? Or should they reject it completely? So that's all it is. It's it's sounds way scarier than it is, right? And it's mm -hmm. all really good stuff to have to protect your brand. Right. Oh my gosh, I love how in just a couple of minutes you have demystified, de-scarified <laughs> these acronyms and these concepts that have been bandied around. I know from the business owners that we work with, you know, a lot of small business owners in particular are really worried about what this means and unsure of what mm -hmm. this means. And the acronyms are scary. And you've just kind of just drilled it down to things that actually sound like and feel like good things. These are actually things are, that are yeah. protecting us. So I love that you truly really turn that around. I hope as you're listening, you're going, okay, this feels doable. Cheryl's made this feel like it's a thing I can do. Now, who might help us with this? If I'm listening to you right now and thinking, okay, okay, that'll make sense conceptually, but I don't know how to, I don't even know how to find my DNS record. I don't know where to copy and paste the code. I don't actually know how many places I'm sending email from, like who in their organization might help them or where might they go to get help with this? Well, yeah, definitely. If they have an organization, if they have a tech person that they have um, hired or a contractor or VA that's a tech inclined, not every tech contractor knows this stuff, though. So you have to check with them to see if they do know these things. Um, that is the hardest part, I think, is it's still mm -hmm. technical. It's still like anytime yeah. you have to do anything with your DNS records, it feels a little bit scary, right? It's like, yeah. I don't really want to uh -huh. touch these things. Like, I don't want to break anything. Um yeah. So yes, definitely. If you're not comfortable, if you're like tech inclined and like, okay, now I understand it. I got it. I can do this. Go for it. If you need help, then um, anybody you have on your team who is your tech person, which is good to go to. But I also created a workshop series to help people because they, that was the biggest question I was getting. It was like, Cheryl, can you help me? And I'm like, I can't help thousands of people one-on-one, -on -one, but actually I can teach you to do it in a step-by-step, -step, easy to understand way. And the best part about that is then you understand it actually, and you know how to mm. do it, which I actually like better because this is email now. Like this isn't just a one-time thing. You need to 
know, like next time you sign up for an app that sends email, you're going to have to implement these right away. So you're, yes. and we change tech stacks all the time as entrepreneurs. Like we like to play around with that. So it's really good stuff for you to know. And you are capable of it. It isn't that hard. It's just technical. And once you do it once or twice, you get in there and work with it. It's not scary at all anymore. Mm -hmm. And Cheryl, I'm so glad you mentioned your workshop. I mean, uh, for anybody that knows Cheryl, knows that knows her work, has been in any of her training, she really does a fantastic job, as you can probably hear on this episode already, translating scary, complex stuff into pretty easily understandable stuff. So we'll definitely put a link to your mm -hmm. workshop in the show notes for today. And as you're listening, we'll give you uh, uh, details on how you can access those notes a little later on. And, and just as kind of a follow-up question, and you've probably already answered it mostly, but I just want to give you an opportunity to say anything else about as an email marketer with these changes that are coming, what are the core responsibilities? We've updated the, thing, the scary mm. acronyms. Is there anything else that we need to be doing? Yeah. Yeah. We just have to watch our best practices going forward like we never have before. Like it matters more because once you implement those things, once you copy and paste and hit save, now it's your reputation that you're mm. riding on. So if you're getting a bunch of spam complaints, that's on your, that's a black mark on your own domain now. So we do have to be more careful. And one of the best things you can do is clean your list and make sure you're not emailing unengaged subscribers because people, the little realized fact is that your email list is shrinking all the time. That's why we have to keep growing it all the time right. to make up. <laughs> <laughs> it's shrinking from unsubscribes, but it's also shrinking by people losing interest. Right. And with these new changes, when we, call it, we talk about spam, there's two kinds of spam. There's people that mark you as spam, which is really bad. We don't like that. We prefer if they unsubscribe happily. And then there's mm -hmm. the spam filter when you send certain content that they're, they don't like and they send you to the spam folder. So that's a little bit different. But when people are talking about spam, like us as email marketers, we think of real, real spam, like the credit card fraud type spam, right? That's what we think of. But in actuality, spam is just like to Google and Yahoo, they think of it as anything that sort of has patterns of spammers. And we as email marketers can mm. accidentally use those patterns, even though we're real good humans sending really good emails and we're not trying to spam anyone, right? But we can accidentally um, do that. And part of the way we're doing that is by emailing people that no longer want our emails. Mm. And a, a nonverbal way of communicating that is that they just stop opening them. So we need to stop emailing people who stop opening our emails. And that helps your open rates. It feels really good, too, when you clean your list and then your open rates shoot right up. And you're like, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> but it also helps you reach the people who do want to hear from you. Because the more people don't engage with your email, the more Google and Yahoo and Microsoft think you're the kind of marketer that people mm. don't like their emails, right? So the more people engage, the better it looks and the more you'll get in the inbox for the people who actually want to read your emails, but also buy your stuff. So it's it's actually really good business to keep a really clean list. Mm. I just want to touch on this um, idea of the clean list. So they've unengaged and inside of our system, you know, it might be a 90 days or whatever the measure is that says, okay, these people are no longer showing interest because like you said, they're not opening, they're not clicking. Is there anything else that we might do to keep a list clean? That is uh, the most important is I, I suggest if 90 days and more, assuming you're emailing regularly, like most people once a week or at least yeah. every two weeks, mm -hmm. if they haven't engaged with you at all in 90 days, it's time to let them go because the statistics show they're very, they're not very likely to re-engage. But um, a lot of people like to do a re-engagement sequence, mm -hmm. right? Where you send an email out that's really juicy and enticing to make them want to click something to get them yeah. to re-engage with you. I love that, but I like I'd like to encourage everyone to do it earlier than you think you should. So like after earlier than 90 days. 60, after, yeah, because by it. 90 days, you're sending that out. Hardly anyone's gonna open it anyway at yeah. that point, right? They haven't opened anything at all in three months if you're you're emailing regularly. The re-engagement sequence is almost a waste of time and it has really low open rates, which aren't awesome. Yeah, got from it. From a data great. perspective. So I'd like to encourage people to start that earlier. And you don't have to tell them it's a re-engagement sequence either. You don't have to say, hey, you haven't opened my emails in 60 right. days. Would you like to click here? You don't have to do that. But you can just send a check-in. Like, Are you still interested in the topic that you talk about? 
because people change, their lives change. Sometimes they're just not. Right. Um, so just checking in with them and sending them, maybe sending them something for free, reminding them how they found you, like resend them the freebie that they opted in for or a new one or something fun. Make it really juicy and clickable. Let's try and get them to re-engage with you. But I'd like everyone to think about doing it earlier than maybe we have in the past mm-hmm. so that we can oh. actually keep them engaged. I love that advice. I've not heard that idea before and it makes total sense. They're yeah. not just going, please open. <laughs> but, you know, they're already <laughs> opening. I think we're um, bored of that. I think we've seen it yeah. so much now. I don't think it works that great anymore, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a term that we're hearing, especially now with these changes, and that is this idea of borrowed reputation. It's kind of an intriguing idea. Could you elaborate on this and tell us um, what the impact is on our businesses? Yeah, so when I say borrowed reputation, I mean before you authenticate to your own domain. So before you do those lines of code, you're effectively borrowing your your email services reputation, right? And that was okay for a while. I mean, these have always been best practices, but they weren't required, so a lot of people didn't do that. And so those emails still got delivered because active campaign was cool in Google's book or ConvertKit was cool in Google's book. You know, they all fluctuate up and down somewhat based on who's sending email because it's almost like a pooled reputation at that point. But now we can't borrow a reputation anymore. We have to create our own reputation. And that means we also have to uh, do our best to be more consistent emailers to, you know, a lot of people that you know, avoid email marketing a little bit or it feels hard and then they don't email for six months to a year and then they try to get back to it. That's going to be a lot harder for you now because when you email someone you haven't emailed in a year, it doesn't look awesome to Google and Yahoo. And now that's attached to your domain name, right? So ideally going forward, I'd like to encourage everyone to prioritize email marketing maybe more than they have in the past and make sure that they're trying to stay as consistent as possible and, you know, keep, keep engaging with it. I totally agree. I love it. I um, I forget who people are. Like I haven't heard from you from mm-hmm. a year and now you're emailing me. It's like I can't even remember what I signed up for. So that consistency and that frequency and recency, as a friend of mine likes to say, I feel is such an important part of the success that I know we have um, with our email list. Mm-hmm. As we're getting these recommendations from uh, Google or Yahoo on what to do, is there anything we should be wary of? Yes. Uh, oh, that's a great question. Okay wary of. What what I see as big mistakes happening is people assuming that their ESP, their email service provider is taking care of it for them. They see everybody oh. going, oh, ConvertKit handled, oh, Kajabi handled that for me. And they, they're they using that as like, I don't need to worry about it. And that's great. If they're helping you do it, I, that's three cheers for them. That's great. But <laughs> they're only helping you with their portion. Right. You are responsible for your entire brand. Kajabi doesn't know where else you send email from. So the advice they're giving you is in a silo mm-hmm. and may not be the best advice, like holistically for your whole brand. So don't assume everything is done if you've only like looked at one company and and just that's my that's my biggest complaint right now with them all. And they're trying really hard not to freak people out, which I can appreciate. And a lot of the help documents and stuff, um, they almost dumb it down to a point where they're not willing to explain what it is. And so mm. people aren't understanding. I think when you have like an understanding, like I said, with, you know, an approved senders list, sign them with a wax seal and then have a backup plan. It's not that complicated to understand. And once you know that, it's like liberating. It's much easier to do the technical parts. But I think a lot of the companies have been not explaining what things are, saying, oh, don't worry about it just do this and this and don't worry about it. Mm. There's a lot of um, confusion that happens with that. So that's my number one thing is make sure that you look at your whole brand and all the places you send email from. Number two thing I hear is people think it doesn't apply to them Mm -hmm. because uh, Google, when they first released it, had two sets of rules they released. One was if you send over 5,000 emails in a day, you were considered a larger bulk sender. And there was two sets of rules released. And that's 500 or sorry, 5,000 emails in a day, not every day, just one mm-hmm. time. So if mm-hmm. that's like cart closed day, that's four emails. 
that's 1,250 people, right? Not 5,000 anymore. And you only have to do it once to be considered a bulk sender. So you don't okay. have to keep the threshold consistently, just mm. one time. Mm. But here's the here's the catch I think everyone is missing is Yahoo copied Google, like followed Google with the same sort of restrictions and rules. They didn't name a threshold. They just mm -hmm. said everyone. And so... Um, with Google, if you sent under 5,000, you needed only one or the other, the SBF or the DKIM, so the wax seal or the approved senders list. Just do them all. Like, let's right. just do the best practice, especially if, if email is your business and you make money from email, it is not worth messing around and it's just not worth ignoring. Like, it's just something we got to learn. We can all do it, I promise you. And mm -hmm. we just need to do the best practices going forward. Right. So that's the thing yeah. that makes me nervous that I hear a lot of people say, oh, it doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. Like, but does it? We don't really know. So it's better just to do it at this point. This is so powerful. I know the reason I even knew to do something was the um, CRM that we use sent us a big note saying, these are the changes that are happening. Here's a little guide we put together. Go watch it. And so we sent it across to the techie person on our team and said, here it is. Go do whatever they say to do. Now I'm thinking, oh, maybe it is just very like myopic in what they've suggested. So I will be getting her to listen to this <laughs> <laughs> and go, did we miss anything? Have we missed anything? And I love Just double check it. Yeah. Yeah. To just double check it, but also just to take responsibility for, you know, getting the right information, doing the mini course, like getting someone like really like you said, this is our reputation and mm -hmm. this is us wanting to continue to build relationships through email with our customers ongoingly and for us to actually land in their inboxes. So this is really worth the time investment and the figuring it out and the hiring someone if you need to, to just make it happen. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. That's awesome. Yeah, my pleasure. I know it can be so confusing. So try to distill like what the noise is out there is really mm -hmm. important because it's very noisy out there right now. Yeah. And a lot of people are talking about it who are not experts in it as well, right. which makes it even more confusing. Everyone's got a foot in the door because it's the new thing everyone's talking about. Mm -hmm. But my advice is to take care of it no matter what size your email list. You're going to need it eventually. Let's just do it right from the beginning. Great advice. Let's err on the side of caution. I, I agree with you completely. If we're sending emails, as you said, we rely on it for our business. Why not just take care of it? Like Cheryl's already told us how easy it is. So we can do this. So I also loved what you were saying about like, because we've been talking now about reputation. You're really moving beyond just those initial things we've got to do with copying and pasting things into our DNS. Now it's about being a good email citizen, being a good marketer, being a good human in the world is really what it's about. And you spoke about this nonverbal communication, which I loved this idea that actually when somebody's not talking to you they're telling you something when they're not mm -hmm. opening your email they're telling you something and that is that your emails aren't interesting to them or you didn't do enough to earn their trust or their curiosity or whatever it might be and so there's these non-verbal cues being sent back to our rep to impact our reputation mm -hmm. number of inactive people on our list etc we need to be cleaning those people out but there's actually another very clear thing people do to tell us that they don't like our emails and that is that they they click and put us in that spam folder or they click the button on our uh you know our um email that says they click those three little dots on google and say <laughs> like a spam right what i just wanted to touch on is the changes that are upon us there's some really important things to understand around spam. I mean, I've been doing email marketing forever since like 1999 and we used to, the golden rule of thumb was just make sure not more than one in 1,000 emails got triggered as spam, but that's really on the email service provider side. And mm -hmm. now there's a whole new way to think about those metrics and also it's not just what's happening on our email service provider side. Could you, in your fabulous Cheryl way of demystifying things, just speak to this just for a minute or two about the new things that are happening with spam? Yeah. So the reason all of this is happening in the first place is to crack down on spam. That's like why mm. they're doing this in the first place. And it's not because they're trying to help us out with cleaner inboxes, right? Google and Yahoo are businesses and it, spam isn't helping them any either. So 
because they're doing that, they're also cracking down on all the ways spam affects email. And one of them definitely is spam reports. So if you end up in the spam folder, that's happening at the filters after the email is delivered. Where it ends up inside your Gmail or whatever is a separate conversation. So what you're talking about is when people mark it as spam, mm -hmm. say like, this is spam, this person shouldn't be emailing me. First, before we get into it, let's. you said about good email citizens. Let's all recognize it's very detrimental to businesses to mark them as spam. Just unsubscribe mm. happily and be mm. on your way. If, you know, I would like everyone to just be good email citizens when they receive email as well. Right. But point. when we're sending an email, yeah, we can all do a good job of just, mm -hmm. there's no need to mark people as spam. Just unsubscribe. <laughs> But um, for us as email marketers, yeah, so the metrics have changed. So the, the litmus of what's allowed is changing. Um, before, uh, the spam threshold with Google, for example, was around 0.1%. But you can go a little above, a little below, and it wasn't the end of the world. Your, your reputation might go up or down a little bit with Google, but it wasn't like the most drastic thing in the world. You still, it started to affect your spam, like where if you end up in the spam folder, if you get too high, but it wasn't like drastic, like it is going to be going forward, going forward, they're implementing much harsher rules for spam complaints. Those are, those are when they mark it as spam. And so now going forward, we're looking at um, still your reputation will be affected at 0.1%. But as if you get to 0.4, you could be blocked from sending email completely. Mm -hmm. So I've seen some clients this month. This was supposed to be starting already, but they're slowly or slowly implementing it out. And we don't really know about the phased approach with this quite yet. I've seen some people go over that threshold and haven't been blocked yet, but they did say that. So it, we need to try our best not to find out really, right? Like we don't want to find out what happens when you get that high. Right. So it's important. And this is all stuff we already know. Make sure you're getting consent to get to put people on your email list make sure it's clear and they understand it's an email list set expectations early on set your email sending frequency early on to like let them know what they can expect mm -hmm. um if your email service provider allows it you could try to give them options with that like if you're a daily emailer let them choose weekly if they want you know like be, right. give them some options so that rather than getting you know, like she's in my email inbox every day spam well, you signed up for that and you knew that, right? It's frustrating, right? For us right. as marketers. But if we can give people options, that's better as well. Um, and setting expectations for sure and letting them know what the relationship is early on, like in a, a welcome sequence is great for that. But we do have to um, just pay more attention now, definitely with email. Oh, and you asked about how it's different. So what I'm mm -hmm. talking about, these are Google's new reels. So this has to do with Gmail inboxes. Mm -hmm. that's different than the spam reports you see with your e email service provider. Those are when they scroll to the bottom of the email and they unsubscribe and then they go to a form and say whatever they need to say, yeah. right? That's actually internal with your email service provider. So that's better. If people do that, that's less detrimental because that's right. inside the email service mm -hmm. provider. And they use that to know who is good senders within their company. Like, you know, because you can get you know, a little smack on the hand if you get too high within your email service provider because they want to have good sending habits as well. But with Google, it has to do with Gmail inboxes. And so they've set that threshold for that specifically. They are part of it specifically. And that's like you said, the three little dots and then marking mm -hmm. as spam within like Gmail inboxes. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for distinguishing that, right? Because I think a lot of people are looking at what their email service provider is saying and they're completely oblivious to this other kind of situation that might be brewing and really detrimental, especially if they get blocked from sending email completely. Yeah, I'm very mm. curious to how it's going to play out that way. Mm. Definitely keeping a close eye on that. So, yeah, and Google doesn't report back to the ESPs no. either. So that information, it's different, right? Right. Yeah, it's, it's stuff that you don't necessarily know about unless you look for it. Right. How do we look for it? How do we find that? Google Postmaster Tools. Yes. It is one of their free Google uh, suite tools, and you can sign up for it. There is, in order to verify your website, you do have to do a little bit of DNS code. 
So mm-hmm. I'll show you how to do that if you need help doing that. Okay. But um, you can sign up for a free account and that's how you can watch your own reputation directly with Google. Ooh, yeah, thank that you for sense. sharing right. that. Because I mm-hmm. think, you know, I'm not sure too many people or how many people are doing that right now and it's going to become increasingly important. Yeah. We've, we've been teasing this timeline. You mentioned the, the timeline might be a bit squidgy because, you know, it's supposed to have already passed and yet we're still seeing people, you know, infringing some of these rules. But tell us, what do you know about the timeline? What what should we be thinking about as business owners? So they originally announced this in October and uh, the deadline was February 1st. All mm. of this was coming down February 1st. But getting closer to February 1st, they changed some of the rules and they said as of February 1st, they will be issuing error codes for a portion, a small portion of unauthenticated mail very vague. They love to be vague with us. I don't know why they have to be so vague. Um, So the good news is if you haven't done email authentication yet, you haven't done that SPF, DKIM, DMARC part of it yet, there's still time to do it. So they pushed the, the hard deadline to April. So if you're sending an email right now, you might get an error code saying, um, no, you can't send those. those un- <laughs> <No>. You're unauthenticated. <laughs> or I've seen error codes in recipients boxes, like it's gone to spam, and there's like a banner at the top that said this was some sent from somebody who's not authenticated. Is it spam or isn't it? That's terrible. I've seen some of that. It's not consistent though. Like I said, they mm-hmm. said portion of unauthenticated mail. Um, so I've seen a few of those happening with with some clients and students. Mm-hmm. Um, The good news, though, the hard deadline has been moved to April, so there's no time to waste. You want to look at it right away because some of the stuff might take you a little bit of time to learn or to figure out. I mean, the actual doing of it probably take you half an hour, but it's the figuring out what to do and and what where all your stuff is located and that kind of thing might take a little bit of time. So don't waste time. Get it done as soon as possible so you don't need to worry about what day in April they flipped the switch, right? Or what, <laughs> I don't know. It's very, it's all very vague, which is complicated. You know, like just give us a real deadline. But it does, mm-hmm. it's actually good news that they made an extension to give to give people a little bit of time to yeah, get organized. Really I think the bigger is. senders will be held to a higher standard too than, than the smaller senders. Yeah, I'm very keen to get this information to our community because they are smaller and they may be thinking it doesn't really apply to me. I'm Mm -hmm. not doing that sort of bulk, um, but I'm glad they've got that extension of time just to make sure that, you know, their little businesses are protected. Um, So thank you for taking us through the tech adjustments we need to make, um, some of the strategy around staying out of the spam box. Are there any additional steps that you would recommend that we take to ensure that our emails not only get into the inbox, but also really capture the attention so that people are opening and they are clicking on them i have all i mean we could we could talk all day about that i think you're you're marketers we could probably talk all day about that definitely knowing your ideal buyers speaking directly to them you know go back to your foundations of messaging and connecting um but when it comes to like trying to stay out of the spam filters so you don't end up in the spam folder you want to look at your emails under a little closer microscope going forward and remember that spam to them is patterns so anything that Mm. spammers are doing becomes a red flag to them right are spammers using a ton of emojis because they're using ai yeah they are yeah right Mm-hmm. Maybe don't use a ton of emojis. You know, a couple here and there is fine, right? Don't put like 10 exclamation points at the end of a word that appears like something a spammer would do, right? You're going to watch some of the language you use. Um, the word free and by now, you want to use it in context in a sentence whenever possible and not just by now or free today in your subject line. That's it. You know, little things like that, little tweaks make a big difference. Um Maybe we don't have time to teach all the ins and outs of what to do and what not to do. But the most important thing I think anyone can do, which will help your messaging to your people as well as, as keeping on the spam folder, is read your emails out loud mm-hmm. and imagine you're saying them to a human being in front of your face, mm-hmm. like a friend or whatever. Like, would you say, click here to buy now to your friend? <laughs> Probably not, right? So can we get more creative with our language? Um, and maybe with like calls to actions, tease what's on the other side of it instead of just being, it's almost lazy these days to just click here. Mm. We can do better than that, right? Like 
So I feel like the friend test is the best way to go and reading out loud so that you can remain conversational and human, right? So I think that's that's my number one tip, I think, for sending emails I love that. Stand up spam text. folder and people like to open. Yeah. I, I love it. Um, and, you know, some of it is sometimes we're modeling other people's emails and everyone's just saying, click here mm. to buy now. So we just go, okay, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So you're asking us to be really thoughtful, which I really appreciate. And you have courses and programs and different ways where you will actually take people through those deeper steps of getting the attention and getting the engagement of our subscribers. So we'll be putting all that information alongside uh, this interview. Cheryl, this has been such a powerful conversation. Is there anything you would like to leave us with? No, just thanks for having me. I actually, maybe, maybe this don't, I've, I've heard feedback from some people. This feels very scary. And will I break the rules? Won't I? It feel, it can feel like you want to not email. You must yeah. sit down to email and you're freaking yourself out. Like, I don't know, is this good or is this not good? Is this going to get passed? Yeah. Just send the email, right? I would like to encourage you not to overthink it. Approach it as a human with that human friendship lens to it. That really helps. Follow these rules. Do these little technical back end bits. But just keep emailing because that's how you get used to it and that's how you get better. I don't want anyone to be in the freeze mode here because it's tempting to do when it feels scary, right? It's to stop. But um, email is still the best ROI of all the channels. And you really just learn by doing it. So I just would encourage everyone to send the email. You're awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Michelle, I absolutely loved everything Cheryl had to say. I could listen to her all day. <laughs> Isn't it great hearing a communicator who mm. is such a master of their subject that they're able to take complex ideas and make them simple and also sticky? You know, she spoke about high, technical jargon that is mm. baffling and she just brought it back to something else like a wax seal or, you know, your approved senders list. She was able to demystify things that I think have been mystified for most people since they started email marketing. So it was really great to hear her just as a communicator and a person with expertise kind of translating her expertise into great content. Mm. And in preparation for today's interview, Michelle and I were getting familiar with Cheryl's information, the different programs she runs, and we were both so impressed um, by her clarity in her communication, her ability to convey uh, messaging in a really compelling way. And so just separate to what we're talking about here today, we're going to really encourage you when we give you the details to learn more about Cheryl is to really just look at her marketing and look at what she's doing, because it's really, really exceptional. Some of the best work I've seen in a long time um, from a marketer. So we'll get to all that. What we do want to do right now is um, we want to recap on a couple of the things that we're taking away from what Cheryl said. Michelle, would you like to kick us off? Sure. I think that this was a through line through everything she said, which was really about being a good human, really, and specifically being a good email citizen. And she used that great phrase, the friendship lens. You know, she said, Read your emails and imagine there's somebody right in front of your face who's a friend. How would you speak to them? And Susie was just mentioning Cheryl's, you know, the way she communicates in her emails and her webinars. And I do second that motion to go and check out her funnel and just see how she's communicating. But she's really walking this talk that it's okay to speak to people in plain language, in the way you might speak to a colleague that's standing next to you or a person that you might meet in the street that is asking for your help with your topic area. Yeah. I think we think with marketing we have to do some other weird language that isn't ours to be marketers, and uh, that is not true. That's something, a, a myth we're trying to bust constantly on this show, and Cheryl does such a nice job of walking that talk. But just despite all of the changes that are coming and the technical details, it's kind of like SEO, you know, with SEO, you, you just got to mm. put out good content. It's the same with email. If you're putting out good content, if you're keeping people engaged, if you're keeping a clean list, if you're speaking to people like you speak to a friend, if you're doing a lot of those things, you're already so far down the path. Of course, there's some specific technical things to do and we'll get to that. But mm. just this good email citizen thing really I thought was a big, big point. And you know who doesn't have a good human friendship lens? ChatGPT, 
Like <laughs> that's what if you're using AI exclusively to do your emails and you're not injecting the humanness and that friendship lens in there, you're going to end up with emails that don't sound very friendly at all. You know, they are obviously for me anyway, I don't know. I'm sure, Michelle, you can detect it too. I can pretty much tell sure. when AI has written an email because it doesn't have that friendship lens. It's all a bit buttoned up. Uh, and so that's just a little precaution I wanted to give you. Um, one of the things I'm taking away is because we have uh, had an email list for a million years. And so we have uh, lots of people on our unengaged list. And a lot of them are people we paid a lot of money for <laughs> to acquire those leads. But for whatever reason, they haven't been engaging. And so it can be so tempting to want to email them uh, because we invest in money in them and it's like seems such a waste but that was such a really good reminder to not do it because you know the system is paying attention and it's not going to be good for your reputation to be reaching out to people who have already silently said I'm not that interested because they haven't responded they haven't opened they haven't clicked so that was a big takeaway for me Michelle. I'm so glad you underlined that because psychologically we just think oh no no we'll get them we'll get them to come around mm. but it's hurting our reputation so much that the the value exchange isn't there anymore and actually we're going to give you a link to Cheryl's um workshop but one of the things I saw her say in that workshop was she had a graph the the, the metrics don't lie it blew my mind the chances of somebody re-engaging with you after 90 days is down to one percent one percent chance they're going to re-engage with you so it's really it's going to be very hard to win them back so i just want to reiterate your point susie and cheryl's point get them off your list after 90 days if they haven't engaged otherwise it's hurting you and you really have very little chance of doing anything to get them back i do want to speak susie about the the technical things i loved how cheryl made it feel not too scary and not too hard there are some practical things you need to do now. Uh, we're going to put a link to Cheryl's information in the notes today, as we said. Uh, but like Cheryl said, if you're a, a bit tech savvy, there's only a couple of things you need to change. This episode's given you a lot of details around that. Um, if you've got a tech person that maybe helped you set up your emails in the first place or somebody on your team, of course, they can help you as well. Wonderful. I um I love that too. And here's the thing, I'm not going to do the things, Michelle. Mm -hmm. I'm not the techie person. And so maybe you're not the techie person either, but someone needs to do these things. So you want to definitely do it before the deadlines that we shared earlier, uh, because it's just too important for your business, um, even if it does sound scary. And as I mentioned, and when we were talking to Cheryl, you know, we have someone on our team. Now, maybe you don't have someone on your team, but there are people out there that will do this for you. So you want to um, make sure that you get it handled. Um, the other thing, which was again just a great reminder was that we are responsible for the effectiveness of our emails for um, the results that we get for keeping our lists clean for being compliant for watching our stats for all those things the thing with email is it's always been this such a bonus that we have this opportunity to get right inside of people's inboxes for practically no dollars, but we still need to be very responsible for getting the results. And so the more that we can be good email citizens, the less it's going to cost us to having to keep topping up our email list because people are leaving. So just that area of responsibility for me was, again, a really great reminder. Yeah, and it can feel like, especially with, if you read the media, like it's all out of our control. And I also love that Cheryl's like, no, no, hang on. It's all actually mostly in our control. These are just a few things that are being done to, that are actually good. They're good for all of us. So I love that reframe. Yes, we still have a lot of control over our reputation and over the effectiveness of our emails. And by extension, that kind of brings me to the last main takeaway I wanted to share. I'm taking pages of notes, but the one I wanted to mention was about uh, her comment that spam is really a series of patterns. You know, millions and millions and millions of emails are sent every day. The only way that places like Google can really figure out what spam is is to look at the patterns. Right. And so I love what she said about that. We can accidentally step into a pattern that is the pattern of a spammer, even though we're a good citizen. So just being vigilant about uh, avoiding some of those spam patterns, but not so vigilant that, I, that we freeze up and we don't send email, right? Keep sending mm. email. That was the other great piece of advice. So be, be prudent, tick the boxes, literally tick the boxes, do the things you're supposed to do. 
but then just be a good citizen and get those emails out there because you've got 90 days once somebody joins your list to have them want to hear from you and stick with you or they're out or, you know, 90 days from the last email that they interacted with. So definitely be mindful of those things and get out there and put out some great content. Mm. And one of the things that's going to have you be more confident is just to continue your education in this area. And Cheryl's put together a free workshop. We're going to give you the details on how to get it hold of that uh, in just a moment. Um, but before we do that, we want to do a quick shout out to one of our regular listeners. That listener is Melanie Campbell from Confidently Perry. She was listening to our step two episode. Now, this is episode, I think, like number 11 or something. It's one of our oldest episodes, one of the most referenced episodes, which really highlights the importance when someone is downloading something from your website or signing up for something, what they see immediately on the thank you page or whatever the next thing they see is such an important opportunity for you to take them um, by the hand and move them towards buying from you. And so she said about this, I love this episode. I learned so much from listening to it. I just need to work out how to apply it to my business. And so she's putting together a course um, all for women who are perimenopausal. And so she's looking at how do I apply this step two idea to my business? So that's something that she's getting support with inside of the, her business community. So how do you get Cheryl's um free workshop. How do you learn more about Cheryl? You head on over to our website at herbusiness.com forward slash good email. That's all one word, herbusiness.com forward slash good email. And you'll find all the details for Cheryl there and then anything else that we mentioned uh, here on this episode. Now, in the next episode, we have another amazing guest. Um, and Michelle, would you like to tease what we're going to be talking about? I'd love to tease it. And, you know, uh, we go sometimes you know, a number of episodes without a guest, but I do love that we have uh, another guest here We're in a little purple patch of guests. And this is uh, the amazing Omar Zenham from, and he's had a podcast for a number of years called The $100 MBA. And it is a fantastic podcast. It's been hugely successful. Now we could talk to him for a week about podcasting. I mean, he's probably forgotten more things than most of us have learned about podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> the thing we really want to talk to Omar about is how to monetize our podcast and what we might do. And, you know, it might not just be ads. There's a whole bunch of strategies that you can be using to leverage a podcast. And even if you do not have a podcast, I suggest tuning into this episode because a lot of what he shares is mappable to other things you might be mm. doing. He's a great marketer, a great communicator. Cannot wait to be talking deeper with him about podcasting. Great. And that episode is out two weeks from now. If you don't already subscribe to the show, then you definitely want to hit that subscribe button wherever you are listening. Michelle, anything you want to say before we go? Oh, look, I think just echoing what we said earlier, huge gratitude to Cheryl. Thank you for sharing such nitty gritty information in such a compelling and interesting way. I just encourage you, if you're listening right now, get onto her workshop, get onto dealing with these changes to email compliance and happy emailing. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. We'll see you next time right here on the Content Sales Podcast. Bye for now.